Good morning, everyone, uh, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues. Um, it's a pleasure uh, to be talking to you here today. So my theme is um, the title, uh, What does research tell us about alcohol-related health risks? And this, um, uh, in this presentation I will um, explain to you and uh, present to you uh, the work that is, has been um, carried out in the RARHAP proje project where we have um, tried to summarize the uh, research evidence on alcohol-related uh, risks uh, in order to uh, advise the um, forming of guidelines. Um, so in any work in any country, when people start to think of um, setting up new guidelines, one of the first tasks is to uh, review what the science says about the health uh, and other risks. Um, and this review of the science, it may be a narrative, um, it may be wise people getting together, reading the literature, putting their heads together and, and making a statement about uh, uh, what the literature says. Or it may be a more quantitative approach to trying to summarize what the science says. And recently, uh, there have been three different um, um, high-quality, ambitious uh, uh, guidelines projects where this type of uh, sophisticated quantification of the risks have been carried out. Uh, one in Australia, one in Canada, and one now very recently in the UK. Um, this type of uh, uh, analysis and quantification um, is really heavy work. Um, it requires a lot of resources and a lot of um, very high-level um, uh, uh, knowledge of um, uh, of meta-analytic procedures, etc. And so this is not very easily carried out in smaller and poorer countries. Uh, Australia, Canada and UK um, are bigger and richer countries that have been able to do this. But uh, for all individual smaller countries, it's not necessarily possible. So when we started the RAR Hub project, one of our um, ideas was that perhaps we can do this uh, together uh, for the EU countries. Um, so when starting this type of um, uh, effort, there are several problems to solve. So um, one of the first problems is uh, where to draw the line. Because when you look at the risk functions in the literature, they look often something like this. Uh, for alcohol, there is a J-curve, the lowest risk um, occurs for uh, moderate drinkers or light drinkers. Um, and then after that, the risk increases. Um, and it might be, um, for many people, uh, natural to say that the, this kind of risk curve would implicate uh, that the guideline level should be here, because after that level, the risk only increases. But other people say that it should be here because that's the level that the uh, non-drinkers have and that would be a natural point of comparison. But it's only actually a, a question of opinion and any level in between might be just as good. Um, there is no science uh, telling us the answer to this problem. But it gets even more complicated if there is no J-curve, <laughs> because then it's even more arbitrary. You just have to uh, draw the line somewhere, and because it's a continuous curve, uh, it's really arbitrary. Uh, the, Canadians, um, the Canadian approach was to um, uh, find the place in the curve where the risk is the same as for non-drinkers. Um, then another complication is that if you look at uh, different diseases, 
you get a lot of th these different risk functions. This um, comes from the UK uh, report, but uh, similarly uh, in the uh, in the other countries' uh, efforts, uh, it's based on on uh, cost specific uh, curves. Um, so each of these curves is a meta-analytic review of literature on the risk of one disease by the level of drinking. Um, so to derive drinking guidelines on the basis of this, we need some kind of summary of these summaries. So how do you combine the various risk curves? And another complication is that this, the, the answer to that is not the same for, each for all countries. Um, for example, if this kind of risk curve, uh, which is for breast cancer, if one country has a lot of breast cancer and a lot of uh, causes which have this type of risk function, and uh, less, cause, uh, less deaths from uh, cardiovascular diseases which have this type of risk function, uh, and another country has quite the opposite pattern, a lot of these cases and only li little of these cases, then the implicated um, cutoff point will be different from, for these two countries. So we cannot rely on estimates on overall mortality, because um, uh, that if you have a risk function for overall mortality, it comes from one population which just happens to have one kind of um, distribution of causes of death. So you, ideally, you have to combine the different risk curves for different countries separately and take into account the different um, distributions, distributions of causes of death. Um, so in our project, in the Varha project, our aim was to <laughs> provide this type of summarizing of different uh, risk functions for seven different selected EU countries. And we selected those seven countries so that they would represent the variation of both drinking patterns and uh, mortality patterns. So that we hope that e all EU countries would find a similar country as what they are among these seven countries. So there were Estonia, Finland, Germany, Hungary, Ireland, Italy and Poland. Um, and the work was done by Jürgen Rehm and his team um, from the Canadian Centre for Addiction and Mental Health. Um, he was, or his team, was also responsible for carrying out the quanti uh, quantifications for the Australian guidelines uh, and the Canadian guidelines. And this is the picture of the report, and there's the... Um, the Earl, where you can find it, probably the easiest way to find it is to put some of the keywords in Google. Um, so, uh, a few words still about the method, uh, how we solved some of the problems. Um, or actually, yeah, uh, a further problem is whether it's sufficient to look at mortality or whether we also need to look at morbidity. Um, and it's um, in principle, it would be good to look at both. Uh, but in practice, uh, these kinds of risk curves, robust risk curves, only exist for uh, mortality. So we only looked at mortality. But in principle, there doesn't need to be a bias related to that because the risk curves may be quite similar for mortality and morbidity. Um, and as far as I understand, from the, on the basis of the reports, the Australian um, effort was only, uh, also only based on mortality. Uh, and in Canada and UK, in principle, they also looked at morbidity, but if I understood right, the quantifications were mainly based on mortality. Um, so where to draw the line? Um, in, and there are still, there's one important differentiation between the types of approach. Um, in Canada, they used the relative risk approach. 
so um, this uh, J curve that they derived, um, they, they look at the uh, risk in each different drinking level compared to non-drinkers, so compared to another group of people. Um, and they said that they take the um, level where the risk is the same as for non-drinkers. But in Australia, they used an absolute risk approach. And that means that they calculate the lifetime risk of dying for one person due to alcohol if you drink at this level or if you drink at that level or that level. Um, if you drink at that level your whole life. So what is the uh, risk during your whole life together, the lifetime risk? And it could be, for example, one in a hundred or one in a thousand or one in whatever. Uh, so it's not compared to anyone else. Um, and the same approach is uh, used for calculating environmental ha hazards. So there's a good point of comparison. Uh, there, the limit is often um, like one in one million. Uh, the the uh, uh, um, the risk that is uh, allowed, uh, but for voluntary risks, uh, it's uh, more like whether uh, the question is whether it would be uh, like one in one hundred or one in one thousand, because people accept more risk uh, for voluntary behaviors than they do for involuntary behaviors. Uh, but here too, it's really quite arbitrary, um, even if people say that here it's easier to get the um, level from somewhere and then follow that level, but um, we can choose different levels and one person would choose uh, a higher um, acceptable risk and another one uh, a lower acceptable risk. Um, the Australian approach used this one in 100 um, risk. Um, in UK, they used both the uh, relative risk and the absolute risk approach. And in the RAHA project, the REMS um, report um, used the Australian approach. Um, they calculated the risk both for 1 in 100 risk and uh, also for 1 in 1,000 risks. And then the results that we get from Jurgen REMS calculations were fed into the Delphi survey that Marietta is going to talk about later. Um, and ask them what they think of these results. One further pro How am I doing with time, by the way, Doris? Uh, half an hour left. Half an hour? Yeah, you're really good at time. Okay. <laughs> um, so one further problem, which is quite uh, difficult to explain, uh, but um, it's a difficult question how we treat men and women. And uh, with how we consider whether gender-specific uh, guidelines are needed. Because um, typically women's relative, oops, women's relative risk increases faster than men's when their consumption increases. So on the basis of this, many people say that, okay, women should have a lower uh, guideline limit women should be advised not to drink as much as men, because they're, it, it, it's more, more bad for them than, than for uh, uh, men. But then on the other hand, um, especially for uh, acute uh, risks, like uh, injuries, men have a higher risk anyway. Um, men... Um, since they are small boys, they have a higher risk of <laughs> getting into injuries. Um, and also with the drinking increasing, this absolute risk uh, is, is always higher. Um, and actually, this, this is hypothetical data, I just drew it to illustrate. But uh, the absolute uh, level may even increase faster for, for men. But um, 
if we have this absolute risk level as a criterion, men may reach that absolute risk faster with lower level of drinking because they have a higher level to begin with, just because they are men. And therefore, these calculations often produce uh, or indi would indicate a lower guideline level for men. And for some, at least, it's counterintuitive and it's hard to decide what to do. Should, um, and, and it was, again, something that we uh, tried to feed into the um, Delphi uh, survey to inquire experts what they think about this. Um, the results for Australia and UK, what they decided was that they recommend the same um, limits for men and women. Um, and uh, in the calculations made for RARHA, we made the assumption that the baseline risk would be the same for men and women. So in order not to punish men for being men <laughs> and their kind of like the, the higher baseline risk, we made this in the calculations, we made this assumption that if they started from the same baseline level. And, um, uh, but we also made a sensitivity, or Jürgen Rens team made a sensitivity analysis. So they also produced the results uh, not doing this, uh, uh, making this assumption. Yeah, and then we uh, fed this into the Delphi survey. And then when calculating the, the risks and, and uh, combining it with mortality data, uh, the basis for all those um, estimates uh, were the same as uh, with uh, those used for the global status report on alcohol and health, and uh, which have been used for the global burden of disease work. And here are two examples of um, the results of the calculations um, for Hungary and for um, Italy. Uh, this is the graphical representation. And um, the differences here for Hungary and Italy, they are uh, due to the differences in the cause of death distribution. So we are not assuming that if um, an Italian and a uh, Hungarian person drinks the same amount that it would be somehow physiologically different for them. But because they have different um, causes of death prevalent in those countries, then also the com combining of the risk curves will produce somewhat different results. Um, and here's the results as a um, table. So if we were to use this one in a 1,000 um, result or the criteria, um, then the uh, implicated guideline would be uh, 10 grams uh, or not more, more than 10 grams per day uh, for both men and women. So like one standard drink per day. Um, and if we use this one in 100 uh, risk level as criterion, then for men, the implicated um, guideline level would be uh, approximately two uh, standard drinks per day, and for women, it would still be the uh, one standard drink per day. Um, that was for EU countries combined, or the seven EU countries combined, and here's uh, the variation across countries. And actually what you can see is that there's not that much of variation. Um, that uh, it is quite a common pattern across the countries that um, uh, if this um, one in 1000 um, level is uh, used, then uh, this uh, 10 gram level would be implicated. And for this, um, at least for uh, uh, women, for men, yeah. Uh, and when one in 100 uh, level uh, criterion is used, then um, 
uh, for women it would be uh, 10 grams and for men it would be 20 grams. Um, and the risk uh, in these higher levels is uh, then uh, higher than this uh, criterion. So, what's the role of these technical calculations? Um, we hope that they might be helpful for individual countries uh, in assessing these risks and in, in, uh, when they think of uh, suitable guidelines for their countries. Um, and in this joint action RARHA, um, we use them as one point of departure uh, in the Delphi survey, where uh, we invited experts to um, consider various aspects of um, these uh, uh, guidelines. And that was my presentation. Thank you. So thank you very much, Pia. And as I thought already at the beginning, there is some time to ask some questions. Mm -hmm. And uh, I personally, very, I'm very happy that you uh, explained very well why it is so difficult and so frustrating sometimes um, to, to define low risk. Because it's uh, for sure, when you are pregnant, pregnant women, you should not drink at all. But when you are not pregnant, and when you are a man, and when you are in different circumstances, and maybe in different social situations, uh, for the individual, it's very hard to give the right advice. So um, this approach uh, and this uh, population approach for all the citizens, it's a very um, ex yeah, exhausting, how is it called? It's a very big challenge yes, to yes. face it and to give the right information to all the citizens where mm -hmm. we should present it to. Mm -hmm. So if you have any questions, it's time. Take your floor. There's one. In the meanwhile, Please. I could comment sure. your comment yeah. that uh, actually yeah, I forgot to say anything about it, but uh, all these calculations are based on averages. So an average person... Um, Doesn't uh, exist. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah. yeah, on average they, <laughs> they do. <laughs> but uh, there is a lot of individual variation and, and it is, like you said, a big challenge how that should be uh, taken into consideration when defining the guidelines. You have the box and the microphone. There's a microphone. Does it work? Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, first of all, thank you for a very nice presentation. My name is Jörg Merlund. I'm from the Norwegian Institute of Public Health. And I have a question concerning all your um, presentation of this meta-analysis of the epidemiological data on alcohol consumption and the risk of various diseases. Are those data uh, based only on self-reported alcohol intake by the people? Yes, they are. Um, I am not aware of many uh, epidemiological studies where, well, they may have also additionally uh, had some kind of um, blood measures, but uh, that is never a good replacement for self-reports. No. So far, no better alternative exists. So now comes my question, because uh, we know that there is, in general, a large underreporting mm -hmm. of alcohol consumption. And um, the data from Norway shows that this underreport can be uh, quite high. 70% maybe is not reported by people. And how would that influence the uh, numbers you now give for uh, alcohol intakes? I mean, if mm -hmm. there is actually a large underreporting, the uh, limits would move to the right. Isn't that correct? Well, it is one further challenge uh, on what to do with guidelines. And, and when people in epidemiologic surveys report something, what did they actually drink? And when people think of their own consumption, uh, like, this is the guideline, how much do I drink? And if they drink that I drink according to the guidelines, what do they actually drink? Mm. And there is no clear evidence that this type of underreporting would be very different in the ep epidemiological surveys and in uh, surveys of uh, the prevalence of consumption and or in normal people's 
thinking when they think of guidelines. So if it is consistent uh, across all these uh, sources uh, of data, then in principle it should not be a problem, but it is a challenge. Mm. Emmanuel. Is. Complication, <laughs> yeah. Uh, just one, uh, one comment here. As a matter of fact, this is a part of the paper of Jürgen that uh, was uh, putting a question, why do we accept this level, level that are well beyond the limit that uh, Jürgen and uh, his group identified as a matter of fact in risk? Why do we accept uh, lower or higher risk? So mm. according to your expertise, as uh, also in uh, sociology, and uh, uh, one comment on this, why we do. Uh, why we accept uh, uh -huh. higher risk for alcohol yes. than yeah. for some other? Yes, this is basic to my point of view, also coming from Rara as a message. I guess there are two different answers to that. Uh, people are more willing to accept any voluntary risk more easily than involuntary risk. So if you, it's a question of having some uh, chemical in your drinking water, you're, you don't want to have that at all, uh, whereas if you smoke or drink or uh, go um, skiing downhill, you're willing to accept more risks because you like that behavior. Mm -hmm. But I think with regard to alcohol, we are still more willing to take risks than for, <laughs> for um, smoking or for many other behaviors. And that's probably because it's in Europe our most favorite um, intoxicant. Anne Hope. Okay, thank you. Uh, Anne Hope from uh, Trinity College in Dublin, Ireland. Uh, thanks very much for excellent presentation. Uh, the risk curves, etc., are to focus on the chronic exposure over a lifetime, or exposure if you drink at this level over a lifetime. And so it's about average per day. But, and I, I think that it's very useful. The, the issue is, I think, in, in Ireland and in many other European countries is that we have a lot of binge drinking. So we have a lot of heavy drinking in a particular event. Was this something that was considered? I know in, in Canada and in Australia, they have guidelines around uh, the acute exposure to risk. Uh, was I know that injuries were factored into it, mm -hmm. but I mean, do you think that, that this is something that needs a separate um, approach? I'm not sure. These are the technical calculations, and and for those, I'm not sure that you need something separate. But when you transfer that evidence to a guideline, uh, which people probably have to do differently in different countries and, and how, when you think how you communicate that to people so that it makes sense in their everyday lives, there I think you really have to think of whether you give the guideline as drinks per week or drinks per day. Because like you said, the evidence from the science uh, is uh, an average um, drinking volume per some time period. It's not so that all the people who participated in the epidemiological studies would drink the same day, uh, the same amount every day. It's just an average. And how that the evidence is then translated to your country, or, and how that differs uh, for Finland or Italy, then the wise people really have to put their heads together and, uh, and think thoroughly of that. But I think the, the UK report uh, did quite a nice job on that, so, so it would be worth uh, reading that. Um, yeah, maybe I should present myself. I didn't do that the last time. I'm Kit Bohan from Denmark. Uh, do we really believe in the J-shaped curve? I mean, there has been a lot of question to that, uh, that it could be confounding. Uh, that it might just uh, work for the older people with the heart protection effect. Uh, and, uh, you know, in my opinion, it's hard to, to see the relevance in protecting your heart disease with a cancer-provoking substance. Mm -hmm. It doesn't make sense to me at all. Um, that was, you know, some basic points of view. 
in Denmark we have had these guidelines and we, we, we uh, have realized that we have to have more than one low-risk uh, drinking guidelines. We have to have a, a, a thing, a, a guideline for um, binge drinking too, and we have to have a guideline for uh, risk groups, for young people, for uh, pregnant women, and, and so on and so forth. You can't communicate all these things in just one guideline. Mm. And then I would say that uh, our basic guideline is uh, no drinking uh, is risk-free. You, you can't find a limit where alcohol drinking is risk-free. That is mm -hmm. the basic thing. And we oh, yeah. base that upon the, the knowledge that uh, uh, alcohol is a carcinogen. So yeah. we, have to, uh, we have to communicate a lot mm -hmm. of different stuff. And people, they, they, uh, they should know that it is a carcinogen. Oh, yes. So yes. it's not risk-free. Yeah, and, and I think this uh, work on low-risk uh, drinking guidelines always takes that yeah. as a point of departure, that it's, uh, nobody is saying that uh, the risk-free limit is here. <laughs> yes, it's a communication challenge. And Marietta will later on talk about uh, the Delphi uh, survey uh, results, which um, touch more upon those issues. Yes, um, I'm Peter Rice from Scotland. You mentioned the involuntary risk um, issue and, and the acceptable levels for that being, being much lower, so the risk of being assaulted by an intoxicated person on, you know, mm. late at night or killed by a drink driver or you know, growing up in a, a family where you know, an adult's a, a heavy drinker. Um, do, is it technically possible to model those risks in the same way as the risk to the drinker? Um, and do, do, if, if so, do you think that guidelines sh should do that? Should, should model harm to others, the involuntary risks that are involved with alcohol as well, and try to incorporate that? I, I think technically it's not possible. There, there are no, no similar risk curves um, which could be taken into account in these calculations. Uh, I'm not sure if Marietta's presentation will touch upon this, but in the Delphi survey, the experts were were um, asked also to take um, to express their views about this issue. So maybe some points later on. Okay, um, my name is Axel Bode with the Federal Center for Health Education in Germany. I have a um, comprehension question. Um, you, you look at a population level, right, and you see a linear uh, risk uh, curve, and I'm wondering. Um, is it, would it be possible that uh, um, you don't find this linearity at an individual level? Or put differently, um, you look at a population level and you give advice um, at an individual level, right? Um, or that's how the guidelines um, tend to be understood. And is there, um, can that just be done like that? Is there not like, uh, um, is, it, is it not possible that uh, these risks curves um, follow different patterns at an individual level or, and at a population level? Or um, put yet another way, um, is it really um, 10 pe people drinking 10 grams per day? Is that, does that create the same risk as one person drinking 100 grams? Or did I get something uh, wrong there? Is, a, is that a valid question or um, it's, really, <laughs> uh, it's about comprehension? Uh, not sure, but the, this science is all we have. Yes. You know, we could take the Swedes, for example, and make them an experimental study and make everybody drink uh, 10 grams a day for two years and they, they, the next two years uh, drink uh, 20 grams per day and then we would have, uh, in the end, results how, how that would function at the individual level if you drink at various levels. But that, that kind of science just doesn't exist. We have to work on w what we have and that's average risks uh, for people who just happen to drink mm. that much. I'm afraid it's not ethical to do it. <laughs> we will never no. have this kind of, uh, of evidence. You know, the strength and the, the weakness of the guidelines uh, are that people uh, have the right to be informed about risk. This is the meaning of guidelines. It does not uh, uh, highlight the opportunity to drink that quantity, but the quantity that you, uh, you should not overcome to increase your risk. This is the message. 
is not an invitation to drink that amount of, of alcohol, but only to give the information to people, to the population, because the Ministry of Health set guidelines. It is not in the position to say, okay, you can do it, drink in moderation. This could be also legal implication in terms of possible effects during the long term. So it's not an easy way to, to deal with, uh, with guidelines, but of course, uh, as WHO say, less is better, there is no safe limit. This should be uh, all messages that should be put in the same time, not separate, but all, uh, you know, a full core set of information that you have to give to, to people. So this is my point of view. So, yeah, thank you very much for this part. It's only one side you said already. And I'm very interesting uh, for the next presentation.